pray with me? Oh God of light, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. So I'm going to read from uh, a letter to the people in Colossae. Look in your Bible, it says the Colossians, chapter 3, verses 12 to 17. And uh, if you're interested, I just commend to you to read the whole chapter. I'm just going to read a portion of it today. Uh, the writer is writing to new Christians, people trying to figure out how Jesus wants them to live. So, therefore, as God's chosen people, you are holy and beloved. Put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Be tolerant with each other. And if someone has a complaint against anyone, forgive each other. As the Lord forgave you, so also forgive each other. And over all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. The peace of Christ must control your hearts, a peace into which you were called in one body. And be thankful, people. The word of Christ must live in you richly. Teach and warn each other with all wisdom by singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in speech or in action, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And give thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of God. For the people of God. Thanks be to God. I heard that phrase put on, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. And it made me think what do you put on on Christmas morning? Do you put on a comfy robe and slippers? Do you put on an ugly Christmas sweater? Maybe you think it's cute. <laughs> Do you put on a t-shirt emblazoned with your, your favorite sports team? Uh, maybe you put on an apron and head to the kitchen. I, I'm just going to invite you to tell somebody sitting near you what you put on on Christmas morning. Go ahead. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> some of us really get into the theme. Some of us are like, I just put on my regular clothes and got going. You know, I have always wanted to put on matching Christmas jammies for the whole family, but my family won't go for it. Now my kids are all grown up, they're in their 30s, and Kelly says no. <laughs> Maybe one day I'll get to put on Christmas jammies. Well, the writer of this letter to the people at Colossae tells people to put on, like it's items of clothing, put on compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. Now, the writer may be the Apostle Paul, or it could be one of his followers writing in Paul's name. And the, the letter writer reminds the people to be tolerant and forgiving and to, above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Well, earlier in that letter to the Colossians, the part I didn't read, but I'm inviting you to read it sometime this week, the writer tells the new Christ followers to strip off specific vices, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, idolatry. See, these new Christians are forming a new community, and now they need guidance 
for this new way of living. These new people of God need a deep and heartfelt sympathy for the situations of others. Active compassion and kindness for other people's interests and needs. So friends, think about it. What would it be like to put on the virtues of humility and gentleness and patience like we put on our clothes. Can you imagine your boots or your shoes marked peace and thanks and every time you took a step it was in gratitude and peacefulness? Think about that. What would it be like to walk in peace and gratitude? Or what if every time you wrapped a cozy sweater around your shoulders, you, it was like a, a reminder of love and you acted with compassion and kindness toward other people. We need to put on peace and gratitude and love because living with other people can really test us. Can I get an amen? <laughs> we need these reminders when we are dealing with children and co-workers too, because they can drive you nuts sometimes. So, here's a story. A kindergarten teacher was helping one of her and then she almost whimpered when the little boy said, teacher, they're on the wrong feet. So, she looked and sure enough they were and, and it wasn't any easier pulling the boots off, but um, she managed to do it and then they worked together to get the boots on the right feet. And um, just as they did that, the little boy said, these aren't my boots. Oh, she bit her tongue because she really wanted to say some things. And she's like, why didn't you say so? And, and so once again, she struggled to help him pull these ill-fitting boots off. And then he said, they're my brother's boots. My mom made me wear them. She didn't know whether to laugh or cry. mustered up enough grace to wrestle those boots my boots <laughs> yeah that's why they were so hard to get on see you need patience <laughs> and love and uh, peacefulness when you're dealing with other people especially children well here's another ancient story Theologian Leonard Sweet writes of baptismal rituals that were very different in the early church. And in the, in the early church, uh, they didn't have a little font like we've got here. They've got a, a really big uh, bathtub-sized one, big enough for more than one person to get in. If, you could, if you've ever been in a, uh, maybe a European cathedral, maybe, maybe you've seen something like this. Um, there was a 4th century tradition that instructs the bishop to enter the, the baptistry of the church and um, when they had people, new Christians ready to join, ready to be baptized, the bishop would come in and say in a really loud voice, take off your clothes. And then the people would take off their clothes. There was kind of a, a separation between the men and the women. I'm not quite sure how they managed that. Um, but they were immersed, they took off their old clothes, were immersed in the baptismal font, and then when they come up out of the water, they received a new garment to symbolize their new life in Christ. <coughs> so friends, could you ever imagine part of our uh, church uh, worship liturgy where we say, take off your clothes? Hmm, think about that. Here's another story. I think you, you'll know this one. This is the Hans Christian Andersen story, The Emperor's New Clothes. Now, just to refresh your memory, it's a, a couple of smooth-talking swindlers had, had convinced an egotistical king that he had just purchased the most gorgeous, elaborate, royal suit of clothes that were ever stitched together by human hands. Now, he couldn't see it, but he wasn't going to admit that. Because only people that are hopelessly stupid or unfit for their position can't see the beautiful clothes. Now, in reality, of course, those weavers had stripped 
the emperor naked, and he's parading around in his birthday suit. And yet he is so convinced that he's wearing royal robes that none of his servants or his secretaries or his uh, cohorts or his companions would dare to tell him the truth. Not until a little child blurts out the fact, he isn't wearing anything at all. And then, then perceives and, and realizes that he is naked. Well, friends, this letter to the Colossians is like that child's voice. And it tells us clearly what naked faith looks like and then describes the garments worn by a genuine community of Christ. The naked faith of a new believer is humble and passionate. Humility comes as we realize how much God loves us, as messy and imperfect as we are. And then passion blooms as we share this great good news with others. Because God loves them too. Messy and imperfect. It's God's love that strips away all the bad stuff. The greed, idolatry, sexual immorality, anger, malice, obscene language, lying. This is a stripping off of the old sinful way of life. That's why those 4th century Christians stripped off their old clothes. And then they were baptized and they, they put on a new garment to symbolize their new life in Christ. The Apostle Paul talks of the old person being crucified with Christ. He writes to uh, the Romans in uh, chapter 6. And then he writes to the people in Galatia and he talks about putting on Christ. So this imagery is, is all throughout the Apostle Paul's teachings and, and writings. This uh, clothing, it was imagery of stripping off the, the vices and then putting on virtues underscores that the believer is part of a new creation, a new person, a new humanity in whom the image of God is restored. Well, friends, think about it. Being restored in the image of the Creator through Christ is what makes possible life, that, that fullness, that richness, that flourishing of life that God intends to give us. Life as it was intended to be lived. Colossians uh, chapter 3 verse 12 reminds us that we are God's chosen people. Holy and beloved. Putting on the virtues of compassion and kindness and humility gentleness and patience and, and above all love helps us to do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. St. Mother Teresa, one of my favorite saints, I love to read uh, about her and, and uh, to talk about what she said. Um, here's one of my favorite quotes. Mother, St. Mother Teresa said, not all of us can do great things and when you look at her life, you might think that she did great and, and miraculous things. And she did. But really what she was doing was small things done with great love. And that's what she says to us. We can't do great things, but all of us can do small things with great love. So right now, we are in the Christmas season of the church calendar. The 12 days of Christmas goes to January 6th, the Epiphany. Um, so we are in the Christmas season. January 6th marks the end of that, and then we enter this season called Ordinary Time. And if you're familiar with the church calendar, most of the year is Ordinary Time. I mean, we have these special times of, of Lent and Easter and Advent and Christmas and a few other Holy Days thrown in there. But most of the time is ordinary time. And when you look at your calendar and think about your life, probably most of your days seem like ordinary time. Well, friends, here comes the new year. It's full of ordinary time. And in the middle of ordinary time, God comes with extra 
extraordinary moments that make all the others bearable and believable and worthwhile. Ordinary time is full of small moments with great love. So friends, I invite you to put on your boots of peace and thanks, wrap that cozy sweater of love around your shoulders, and get up every morning ready to do small, ordinary things with great love in the name of Jesus. As we move into our prayer time, uh, I'll call your attention to um, the families that are grieving the loss of loved ones. Um, Barb Owens was a longtime child care provider here, and it is her son that just died of a brain tumor. His funeral is tomorrow at uh, Paul Funeral Home. Um, also, we're, we're uh, grieving Ed Valley, who is a uh, husband of Linda Valley, friend of, of Joni O'Neill's. Joni is also grieving um, her niece. So uh, a lot of a lot of friends that uh, are grieving loved ones. Perhaps you know some others that aren't on this list. Maybe you know of friends that are ill, received a new diagnosis just struggling with their health, maybe with depression, maybe trying to find a job. There are a lot of needs, and they just seem very present at this time of year. Let's go to God in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we come to you aware that uh, we don't do anything apart from your great love. God, you know the ways that, that we are struggling, or the ways that we are challenged in our circumstances, the disappointments and depression that we may battle. God, you know the people that are grieving the loss of loved ones, or maybe just uh, mourning the loss of their uh, expectations. Help us to, to look with love on the, on the people that you place in our lives, to be realistic in our expectations, to enjoy the friends and family that we have around us right now, to honor those that, that we are missing, and to realize that, that you never leave us or forsake us. God, we share the story of, of how your son came to be born on earth. And then we think about how we struggle to live as Christ followers. Send your Holy Spirit into us that we might put on the virtues that you call us to. Especially peace and gratitude, and above all, love. Hear us as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not but deliver us from evil. For the honor is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. As this year draws to a close, I want to thank you again for your generosity and giving to the ministries of this church. Um, we have several ways that you can do that. Um, that putting something in the baskets here. Uh, mailing a check or having your bank send it. Um, I know some folks use PayPal. There are many different ways. Um, if you go on our new website, there's a, there's a place that you can just click and it, and it works. Um, and we are so grateful for that. This year we 
um, that, that we might never see on a Sunday morning. But they are touched by our love and generosity. So I want to say thank you. Our apportionments to the United Methodist Church are being paid in full. And that helps us to uh, help people right here at home and around the world. Uh, a couple weeks ago, there was a tornado that went through St. Charles County. The United Methodist Committee on Relief helped people there. And it also went through Kentucky and Illinois and, and Tennessee. And so the, when we pay our apportionments, we are a part of that. So thank you for that. Um, probably you have joys in your heart. I invite you now just to, to stand and, sh and, and share with one another, share joy.
to love and serve the Lord.